Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Our Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr is with us. So, Barbara, it was striking that the president said that. He called them war games. He called them provocative. He talked about the cost of them, the six-plus hours it takes to fly U.S. bombers from Guam to the Korean Peninsula. What's the reaction from the Pentagon this morning? Well, uh, here at the Pentagon, what they're telling us is they will be in line with the president's directive as soon as they actually figure out what exactly he's talking about because he gave very broad language. So let's step back a minute. They're on a steady state, about 28,000 U.S. troops in South Korea, but they are there solely for the defense of South Korea. And these training exercises, the president calls them war games, are for the defense of South Korea against any imminent North Korean threat. These are not about conducting war. They are about defending South Korea if there is a North Korean threat. So, uh, the war games, uh, they have been going on for many years, and in fact, a major one is already scheduled for August, just weeks from now. So what the Pentagon has to figure out is what does the president really want to happen? Does he want an immediate total cessation? No more training exercises. What will those 28,000 troops in South Korea do now? Will it be just during the negotiations? Will it be all exercises? Will it be the big ones, the little ones? Will it be everything? And what does this actually mean for the allies? Because the Pacific nations, Japan, Australia, other nations in the region also rely on these exercises, also participate in them to help train their own troops to be ready in that region. So there's an awful lot to sort out here. But uh, make no mistake, Kim has got two things pretty much out of the uh, out of the U.S. as a result of these negotiations. He certainly has some commitment on ending the exercises and the president indeed opening the door to withdrawing those troops from South Korea. Just yesterday, Defense Secretary Mattis said it was all going to be steady state, no big changes in the works. Poppy? Uh, this is a huge change, a significant change, a change that would likely be unwelcome by uh, Moon Jae-in and South Korea, or at least something they'd want a heads up on. Do we know if South Korea knew that the president was going to agree to this and then vocalize that agreement? Well, I think that it's very clear that nobody had the details. We've seen a statement already out of the Blue House, the presidential office in Seoul, that they're trying to figure it out. We're getting the same general word around the Pentagon since early this morning. We've been asking sources throughout the U.S. military, and what they are telling us is that they will. the U.S. military will now work with the White House, work with the State Department, and try and figure out a way ahead. There's very little way to interpret that other than this came as a surprise. Poppy? Yeah, a, sur a, a surprise of something Kim Jong-un really wanted, and now he has, at least in the near term. It is Wednesday, the 13th of June of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special, folks, is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Yes, it could just be a egg dish with hollandaise, all right? Country potatoes? Maybe. Okay, I. why would anyone serve country potatoes 
with a, you know, a Benedict. You, you already got the muffin. Uh, you know, come on. And there's already starch in the hollandaise. Come on. Okay, well, 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 Trump has declared peace in our time. He said we could sleep well. And you know what? Neville Chamberlain said the same thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, we're going to tie in a little bit of uh, Trump's uh, Asia trip with uh, you know maybe something that uh, was suggested by... Uh, uh, a particular personage who was known as the mobster dictator, and uh, how all of this uh, might be a piece of a whole. I hope it's not the whole piece, but it could be a piece of the whole, and uh, quite quite illuminating once you start seeing how all the chess pieces fit. Okay, so uh, at the top, uh, that was. Uh, uh, spokesperson, uh, or not a spokesperson, but re, uh, the Pentagon uh, correspondent uh, explaining, well, you know, uh, the Pentagon will obey Donald Trump's orders until, you know, as soon as they can figure out what, what the hell he said. You know, uh, it's also interesting to note that Hitler's generals had a hard time figuring out what the hell he was talking about, too. Uh, you know, so certain things resonated like, you know, rounding up the Jews, separating kids from their families. You know, the generals love that stuff. I mean, that stuff they can do because that's tactical. It's like strategy. It's it's uh, it's, uh, you know, stacking boxes and filing, uh, you know, where they all are. They love that. But uh, most of the other stuff, you know, like attack Russia in the winter? Come on, Napoleon got mired in there. Why would we want to do it? And uh, but they were trying to figure out what he was saying, too. So uh, uh, I don't know. Is this like the evil Jack Nicholson character in The Shining? You know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy over and over and over and over. Uh, it could be. Um, I'm not a big believer in the concept of evil, but, uh, I, if, if we took the cinematic viewpoint where it, uh, you know, manifests itself generation after generation, uh, I don't know. I could get on board with that. It seems, uh, like a plot line. Okay. Well, <laughs> so we got him, he, Donald J. Trump. Uh, declaring peace in our time. And that's, that, that's a, I guess, a scary thing. Now that I'm considering it, it's not even a joke. But, uh, but we do. So sleep well. Uh, he also said that, uh, you know, he felt really bad about Otto Warmbier dying. But good thing he died. Good thing. So the guy has no empathy. He's a sociopath. And uh, a lot of people voted for him. Lindsey Graham says he's so strong. He's strong. Well, you know, mobster thugs are strong, too. And the reason we have government is so that people of just, you know, like average physicality can live without being trampled upon by mobster thugs. I think they called that civilization. But um, so Lindsey, Lindsey likes a strong man. Boy, he does. And uh, what else out there? Oh, <laughs> I dare not mention the unmentionable. 43-point swing, Democrats over Republicans. Oh, my God, since Trump took office. Uh-huh. We'll talk about that a little bit, too, Scott Walker, trying to get out of calling a special election. Uh-huh. Well, we see what the rule of law says about that. Indeed. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. What else is happening? Oh, well, you know, one of the uh, computers here at the mothership is still on the blink, and I guess I got to take it to a genius bar, brain bar, whatever they call it, genius bar. Or I suppose I should try to find a plug-in keyboard because what I have is a wireless, and I suspect it's not getting a signal for the, uh, for the, the keystrokes I'm supposed to do to, like, recover stuff because nothing's happening. 
All right. And uh, so there's that. How's that for a little bit of personal uh, business? Yeah. Well, I guess I should also mention I, uh, a while ago I spoke about my brother-in-law getting pre-op for eh, brain surgery. Well, he had that uh, yesterday. And uh, he's coming out of it. And uh, he won't be the same person that he was. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's some of them that is whole. And now there's some that, uh, well, anytime you start digging around in the brain, uh, it's hard to, you know, not hit nerves. Especially when they're, uh, you know, surrounded by uh, like a foreign object that just happened to be growing there. Okay, but uh, he's awake and talking and fairly happy. And that is what is wonderful and good. So thank God for at least living in this time of modern technology and science so that that kind of surgery can be successful. And uh, indeed, I had a friend who had an aortic valve replaced. Think about that. 25, 30 years ago, there's no way that he would have been able to have an aortic valve replaced. Oh, my God. And now they almost make it outpatient. Oh, yeah, here. Your heart's pumping pretty good. Seems like it's holding. Go go and swing a sledgehammer now. No, they don't say that. But, uh, yeah, it is wonderful to live in modern times for for that reason. Well, I guess we should talk about what's on the rest of the menu because we could just talk a lot about what's going on in the world right now. Oh, my God. I have to put a cap on it. We've curated a show for you. Well, on the rest of the menu... In the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, a Colorado woman faces jail time for writing, Stop Putting Kids in Cages in Chalk, outside the Castle Rock office of Representative Ken Buck. Yeah, you know, he's an anti-immigrant bigot. I, I, I guess I could call him a fascist. Why not? They all are at this point. A Wall Street Journal puff piece from January 2018 reveals... Trump's idea to stop war games around North Korea. Guess where it came from? Yeah, Vladimir Putin. Uh Uh-huh. Rachel last night had a a segment about the little 11-mile border that Russia has right there at North Korea. Interesting, huh? And Devin Nunez is about to find out the hard way that his calls to investigate the investigators are not a one-way street. After the break, we'll then move to the chef's table where the Democrat prevails in the Wisconsin state special election that three separate judges ordered Scott Walker to call. He just didn't want... he, He didn't want to have an election. Republicans hate voting. And... Mueller's team fears sensitive information and investigative techniques used in its prosecution of Russian meddling in the 2016 election could wind up in the hands of Russian intelligence. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. To the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you'll notice to the right-ish of the page the chat room link monitored by Roaring Girl Kelly Lincoln. So uh, engage, do. And to the left-ish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com are the donate contribute buttons. And there's no joke there. We are unable to do this without you. And thank you for your generosity. Uh, uh, The lights are uh, blinking. And we appreciate it so very much. And you can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom uh, takes care of that platform with uh, a pithy statement or two. 
and quite a quite a deluge and a cornucopia too of uh lynx galore if you're gonna have redundancy you're gonna put redundancy on top of redundancy okay come on it's morning radio at least when when it's morning okay uh you can also follow netroots radio on facebook some people still do there you know i put things up occasionally but you can also find out what not all right follow me on twitter at justice putnam and uh, follow West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on Twitter at Cookbook West. Don't ask me why. And uh, also on Daily Co's, I put up the show notes and links diary. And that comes up about 10 minutes before showtime. But uh, there's all the show notes and links from all the previous uh, uh, shows as well. So there. All right. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? Oh, podcasts. Podcasts, of course, can be had by way of Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, etc., etc., etc. Oh, yeah, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIns, iTunes, and where where all podcasts can be found. I don't know. Maybe iHeart. I haven't been auto downloading to iHeart. I have a I have a beef with iHeart. Yep, I do. Okay, well, let's get on with this first story. It is brought to us here at the chef's table at what i'm chef here at the bistro cafe part of west coast cookbook and speakeasy no i haven't started on the french 77s yet that's for friday all right all right here in the bistro cafe our first story is brought to us by lm katami out of think progress and uh let's see oh where are you here there you are all right uh, stop putting kids in cages. Can Buck love Jesus? Is the message one Colorado woman wrote in chalk outside the Castle Rock office, office of Representative Ken Buck, repug of Colorado. For that, she's facing possible jail time. Now, I can understand, I, you know, that what the story is, is getting at is that because she defaced private property because he's renting space in some strip mall or something, right? And uh, uh, so, you know, ostensibly someone has to go clean it up, which usually is the person who wrote the thing in chalk. That's how it works, right? But this is also a state where uh, Colorado citizens have uh, paid parking fines and pennies by the dump truck load, and they dump the dump truck load right out on the street in front of the courthouse. Or they've taken dump trunk, dump truck loads of cow poop and dumped it in front of the door of a politician or, uh, I don't know, a rival cow poop dumper. They do that in Colorado. So I can understand how writing uh, Love Jesus and Stop Putting you know, Kids in Cages in chalk could cause a, a, a fright among the powers that be. Because what's next? Erasable markers? Chalk is a gateway to even more insidious ways of relaying a message. So uh, that's what the gist of it is, is that uh, not only uh, are we uh, not going to attend to the issue that we are Nazis by putting little kids in cages. I mean, we're Nazis for putting adults in cages. We're Nazis for having these supermax prisons. All right. But now we're going to have and do not call it a tent city and do not call it a camp. It is a concentration camp. Complete the sentence. These kids are getting put in concentration camps. And what is the, uh, the lure, the, uh, the con to wrest the kids away from the parents? You know what these ghouls are telling these parents when they're stealing the kids? Oh, don't worry. We're just taking them to the showers. We, will, we want to clean them up. The showers... We're going to take your kid to the showers. Yeah, we're Nazis. And we better start 
understanding that. And I'm talking about all of us. We own this. Liberals, everybody. We're Americans. And this happening under our watch. We're Nazis. We may not be a member of that party, but it's still being done in our name. Silence is advocacy. Stop it. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is uh, an article out of Raw Story by the great Sarah K. Burris. Donald Trump's ideas about stopping the joint military exercises between the U.S. military and South Korea may have come from, that's right, Vladimir Putin. A Wall Street Journal puff piece from January 2018 walked through 50 staffers who gave insights into how to deal with the president after his first year in office. Nested within that story, however, was a story about the conversation Trump had with Putin at the G20 summit last summer. At the time, Trump was angry with Congress for inserting itself into his decision to impose sanctions against Russia. Around the same time, Mr. Trump had an idea about how to counter the nuclear threat posed by North Korea, which he got after speaking to Russian President Vladimir Putin. The journal wrote of the plan in January of 2018 in a puff piece. If the U.S. stopped joint military exercises with the South Koreans, it could help moderate Kim Jong-un's behavior, the report continued. And then Trump announced exactly that on Tuesday. Well, they, you know, they, on the other hand, they plagiarize Michelle Obama all the time, too. So, I mean, okay. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis used an approach that aids, say, can work. He says, your instincts are absolutely correct, and then gets the president to do the exact opposite of what his instincts say, the journal wrote, citing a person close to the White House. Mr. Trump dropped the idea, although he has ordered ordered aides to give the exercises a low profile, illuminating or eliminating press releases and briefings about them. Oh, how interesting. The U.S. had previously said it would never make such a move because the military exercises were part of its military alliance with South Korea and served as a deterrent to Kim Jong-un. Uh, during the 2016 presidential debate. Trump was accused of being a puppet of the Russian president. No puppet, no puppet, Trump said to Clinton. You're the puppet. Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is an article out of Share Blue Media by Carolyn Orr. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein plans to call on the House General Counsel to investigate the conduct of Representative Devin Nunez's staffers on the House Intelligence Committee, CNN reported just last night. The move comes after months of escalating tensions sparked by Nunez's repeated attempts to gain access to classified intelligence related to the Russia investigation. 
on Tuesday. Those tensions boiled over after a Fox News report claimed that Nunez's staffers felt personally attacked at a meeting with uh, with Rosenstein in January. Do you get, you know, when Sally Yates came to the White House and said, look, I think you got a guy in your midst right now who's in cahoots with the Russians. And they all looked at each other and said, she knows. We got to get rid of this B. And they did. Every time they, they meaning the White House, is told, well, this is like the system that we have and this is how it works, they take that as a threat. Who does that? Yeah. Not loyal citizens by any means. The staffers uh, reportedly claim that Rosenstein threatened them with a criminal in- investigation, an account the DOJ flatly rejected. In response to the staffers' apparently misleading claims, Rosenstein will request that the House General Counsel conduct an internal investigation of these congressional staffers' conduct. And that was CNN citing an unnamed DOJ official. Okay. The deputy attorney general never threatened anyone in the room with a criminal investigation, the official added. The FBI director, the senior career ethics advisor for the department, and the assistant attorney general for legislative affairs were all present at this meeting, are all quite clear that the characterization of events laid out here is false. (laughs) White House staffers, who could they be? The DOJ official who gave identical statements Tuesday afternoon to CNN and Fox News said Rosenstein was making the point, after being threatened with contempt, that as an American citizen charged with the offense of contempt of Congress, he would have the right to defend himself, including requesting production of relevant emails and text messages and calling them as witnesses to demonstrate their allegations are false. That's why he put them on notice to retain relevant emails and text messages, and he hopes they did so, the official added. In other words, the deputy attorney general responded to an apparent threat by Nunes' staffers to hold him in contempt by telling them that if they chose to go forward with the threat, he would not surrender his due process rights, including the right to issue subpoenas for evidence to defend himself. Only bullies consider anyone defending themselves to be a threat against their bullying. Uh, Former federal prosecutor Renato Mariotti put it, staffers for Devin Nunez apparently threatened to hold Rod Rosenstein in contempt of Congress in a recent meeting. He told them if they did, he would have the right to subpoena their communications and put them on the witness stand to prove them wrong. He's 100% right about that. Okay. As the top DOJ's as the DOJ's top official overseeing the Russia probe, Rosenstein has become the focus of intense criticism and attacks lawed by congressional Republicans seeking to shield Trump from scrutiny in special counsel's Robert Mueller's investigation. Oh, you mean sedition within the ranks of Congress? Hmm, I wonder. Uh, In April, the White House was preparing a smear campaign aimed at undermining Rosenstein's credibility. This is according to CNN, of course, as part of that effort. Trump reportedly planned to use his allies in Congress and right-wing media as attack dogs to go after Rosenstein, hoping to build a case for firing him without it looking like he's interfering in the Russia probe. As Trump's chief enabler and lapdog, Nunes has led the charge against Rosenstein and the DOJ, calling the DOJ to be investigated for not blindly opening its evidence locker every time Nunes wants to peek inside of it so he can run back to Trump and tell him what he found. But now, Nunes is discovering the hard way that his calls to investigate the investigators are not a one-way street. And unlike Rosenstein... Nunez may find himself in some very hot water once the tables are turned on him. All right, looks like we're ready for our break, and we will do that. When we come back, we'll go through, of course, weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to Network's Radio. 
www.blogtalkradio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, soaring while going under. The new Shailene Woodley vehicle, Adrift, certainly isn't a journey into uncharted genres. It joins All is Lost, Life of Pi, and lots of others in the Lost at Sea category. One reason these films keep getting done is that there is a minimalist elemental appeal to the stripped-down man, or in this case notably, woman versus nature tale. As real events of this sort are usually not complicated, the films they spawn can concentrate on basic film elements. Set in 1983 and based on a true story, Adrift is the chronicle of Woodley's character Tammy, a wandering 20-something who drifts into Tahiti where she meets and quickly falls for a shipbuilder and fellow wanderer Richard, a decade or two her senior, and played by British heartthrob Sam Claflin. In need of funds, the two take a job delivering a 50-foot luxury yacht to San Diego, a nice gig, until they run into a hurricane in the middle of the Pacific. Now, you're not aware of this backstory in the first scene, as that is of Tammy waking up alone and injured in the bowels of the wrecked ship. The story unfolds in nonlinear fashion, which makes it easier to slip in the shocker when the time comes, and also serves to enhance suspense, as director Balthazar Cormacur has the knack for placing the flashbacks. It shouldn't be a secret why Woodley, who's also credited as a producer here, was drawn to the role. It's a continuation of her earlier work as resourceful, powerful female leads. But here, one being tested like never before and emerging somehow more grown up. And this note, to enhance your viewing of Adrift, avoid the temptation to Google news accounts of the original story and let Woodley's Tammy impress as intended. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60-Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. On average, gun violence claims the lives of nearly 100 people every day in the United States. People are dying of gun violence in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, on our street corners, and at public gatherings. David O. Barb, president of the American Medical Association, He spoke June 9th at the AMA annual meeting in Chicago. We've recommended common sense gun safety protections, waiting periods and background checks for those seeking to purchase a gun, and increased funding for mental health services. We've called upon the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to conduct epidemiological research on gun violence. It is perhaps the only leading cause of death where such research is not being conducted. To those who feel we should not address this as an organization because it is too controversial, I would ask, did we shy away from fighting discrimination against AIDS patients in the early days of that epidemic, even though much of society stigmatized those with HIV? No. We let science lead us. And did we mute our opposition to smoking because big tobacco defended it? No. We let science lead us. And even now, have we backed away from our support on universal vaccinations or the gains made through the Affordable Care Act because they're controversial? No. We've let science lead us. So similarly, I would submit to you that the AMA must not back down from addressing gun violence. On the contrary, we must address it head on, scientifically, in an evidence-based, principled fashion, and with the health and safety of our communities, our fellow Americans, and our children 
as our chief concern. While we will not all agree on every proposal introduced on gun violence, we can all agree that this issue must be addressed and that the only way, the only responsible way forward is for women and men of good faith to continue to search for and advocate for science-based solutions. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. American Indians govern themselves by their own tribal laws, treaties with the U.S. government, and by special laws passed by Congress. These laws did not recognize American Indians to be citizens of the United States. As a result, they did not have the right to vote. The first attempt to grant Native Americans citizenship came in 1887 when Congress passed the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act granted attractive land and citizenship to those who were willing to give up their allegiance to their tribe. The law was strongly resented by most tribes. Finally, Congress passed a law in 1924 called the Indian Citizenship Act. This law fully recognized Native Americans as citizens of the United States. The law also gave Native Americans the right to vote in federal elections. That's all for today's podcast. The show's theme song is Complacent by Cheryl B. Englehart. You can find Cheryl online at cbemusic.com. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Wednesday, June 13th, 2016. I'm Seamarie Ainsborough. A major step towards reducing harassment and violence at work for both women and men has been taken. A key committee at the UN's International Labor Organization, the ILO, has ruled that the subject needs to be addressed by a new international law. The ILO is the United Nations specialized agency which focuses on work in the world. It's operated as a tripartite organization by representatives of governments, employer groups, and labor unions. The organization develops international laws called conventions and recommendations, which can be adopted by member states. During the ILO's 2018 conference in Geneva, the ILO's Standards Setting Committee decided that the fight against harassment and violence requires a legally binding convention supplemented by a recommendation on how to address the issue. The employers group at the ILO had strongly objected to a new law, proposing instead a non-binding recommendation. The government and labor representatives overruled the employers. And so now the ILO will prepare material about a convention on violence and harassment at work and present it to the organization's governing body in 2019. Labor leaders applauded the move, but warned that the struggle is not over and unions need to continue lobbying for the convention. Radio Labor talked to Chidi King about the proposed convention. Ms. King is the director of the Equality Department of the International Trade Union Confederation. The ITUC is the global body which represents national labor centers such as the Ghana Trade Union Congress. Ms. King was asked how widespread the problem of harassment and violence at work is. We have statistics coming from various parts of the world. So, for example, if we were looking globally, we would say that at least 35% of women have experienced some form of sexual or physical violence. And this covers the home, the communities, as well as the workplace. But if we were to go, for instance, to Uganda, a survey there showed that 90% of women um, who who were surveyed reported experiencing sexual harassment, so one form of gender-based violence um, in the workplace. Again, in Asia-Pacific, if we go to the Philippines, we had reports concerning domestic violence and the impact of domestic violence in the workplace. And there, 85% of women who had experienced domestic violence reported that it had had an impact on their ability to continue working. Again, staying in the Asia-Pacific, if we go to Hong Kong, in the service sector, a survey there showed that nearly 60% of female employees had experienced some sort of violence, including sexual harassment. So as you can see, it's, it's pretty widespread and very common. Ms. King was also asked how an international labor standard on harassment and violence at work could help reduce the problem. 
Well, I think one of the most important things that an international labor standard could do is signal very clearly that violence and harassment are simply not part of the job. Many workers, particularly women workers, um, given they're often subordinate positions in the workplace, experience forms of violence and gender-based violence um, almost on a daily basis, but are either too afraid to speak up, um, whether it's fearing retaliation, including the loss of their job, or just feeling that nothing much will be done about it. And I think we saw quite a little bit of this phenomenon or quite a lot of this phenomenon in the social media outpouring that came along with hashtag MeToo, etc. So sending this strong message that gender-based violence or violence and harassment are simply unacceptable and not part of the job is one thing. Then it would also place clear responsibilities on governments, employers and trade unions um, on the need to act to end violence and harassment. And again, especially gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, It would raise awareness about this issue, but it would more importantly assist the actors in the world of work to put in place the necessary measures to prevent, address and redress violence and harassment in the world of work. The next ILO conference, which may consider the Convention on Harassment and Violence at Work, will take place in Geneva in June 2019. I'm Seamarie Ainsborough. Thank you for listening. From Singapore, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Take President Trump at his word and the U.S. and North Korea reached two agreements in Singapore on Tuesday, one on paper and one in Trump's mind. A joint statement signed by Trump and Kim Jong-un contained just four elements, two of them expressing vague hope for improved relations and Korean peace, a third on recovering the remains of American POWs from the Korean War, and a fourth, ostensibly the reason we're here in the first place, on nuclear weapons. Chairman Kim and I just signed a joint statement in which he reaffirmed his unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But there was just one line in their agreement addressing nuclear weapons, and all it did was endorse pledges made by North and South Korea in April, a deal purposefully vague and designed to be superseded by more detailed language coming out of Singapore. And if greater clarity on denuclearization exists now, it hasn't been put on paper. Neither has a bombshell concession from Trump to end joint military drills with South Korea, exercises the Pentagon says are crucial to U.S. national security. We will be stopping the war games, which will save us a tremendous amount of money. That wasn't the only matter Trump claimed to have hashed out with Kim apart from their formal agreement. He also claimed North Korea had pledged to end nuclear and missile tests and destroy a key missile development site. But those deals came too late to write down. And all of that begs the question... Are the U.S. and North Korea actually close to historic breakthroughs on a range of fronts and just holding back to hash out the wording? Or after weeks of high-level talks, are the two sides no closer to a deal than they've been all along? Either way, Trump made it clear that picking up the pieces of U.S.-North Korea diplomacy after Singapore is no longer his job. It's a task reserved for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. So, Mike, our whole team has to get to work and get it completed because otherwise we've done a good job. But if you don't get the ball over the goal line... It doesn't mean enough. Luke Vargas, Singapore. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. And uh, we might as well begin with the weather because we always do. That's what we do at this point. And we always begin the weather along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, (laughs) where it is currently 55 degrees. Oh, my gosh. And... uh, Though it does feel a little bit warmer than 
55 right now. So at least that's what it is uh, with the weather station the guy has. Well, I guess his station would be a good seven miles away from me. Where the uh, the not so accurate uh, gauges I have here at the mothership, uh, it's registering you know more around sixty, and that's what it feels like to me. We're gonna be a bit cooler than yesterday. We were well above ninety yesterday. We're gonna be around eighty today, and uh, right now winds are out of the southwest at a negligible one mile per hour. We'll be picking up in a few hours. Uh, let's see, shifting. Then to out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, continuing that wind speed and direction through the night. And then it'll shift uh, out of the north northwest uh, tomorrow morning. Okay, and let's see. Uh, grass pollen remains very high. I have no data on air quality. And uh, though I did smell some wood smoke like the, the it's suspiciously like a, a fire. Though it could have been a grass fire, though the winds were blowing a little bit. I don't think grass fires were what you can do in those winds. Uh, but right now I have no true data on air quality, and the UV index remains very high at 9. So if you ever have those numbers, you better take care. Relative pressure is falling at 29.9 uh, inches. Uh, visibility is 10 miles and relative humidity is 57%. I'm sorry, uh, pressure is falling at 29.9 inches. Okay. And it looks like we have no rain in the offing for days and days to come, though it would be nice. We always like rain because I live in Oregon. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 70 and partly cloudy. Paris is 63 and partly cloudy. Rome is 77 and partly cloudy, uh, though they do have a thunderstorm and uh, rain advisory that could knock out their infrastructure, because that happens. Kiev is 83 and fair. Kabul is 81 and fair. Hong Kong is 76 and cloudy. Tokyo, 69 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 54 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees and sunny. And they continue to have small craft advisory on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 71 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people positively live around the world. The great Sarah K. Burris out of Raw Story uh, starts us off here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Okay, Scott Walker did not want to call special elections for two Republicans, presumably because the seats were expected to flip, flip to Democrats in the anti-GOP political climate. I think it's uh, GOP Trump. Of course, on the other hand, you look at a bunch of these toadies and you're wondering, yeah, maybe we don't want toadies. Walker was ordered to schedule the elections by Dane County Circuit Court Judge Josanne Reynolds, who said the governor had a plain and positive duty to hold the elections. Reynolds was appointed to the bench by Walker in 2014 to probably prevent the kind of ruling that she made. To state the obvious, if the plaintiffs have a right to vote for their representatives, they must have an election to do so, Reynolds said in the decision. And uh, that was after two other judges in the state said, yeah, you know, you got to hold a special election. We're a dem democratic republic. What are you talking about? Senate District 1 won't make a measurable difference in the Senate, however. 
It will narrow the margin of 18 Republicans to 14 Democrats in the Senate, and it will further add to the Democratic enthusiasm that has prompted the party to champion a blue wave. Tsunami! The district includes parts of Fond du Lac County, which voted for Trump by more than 14 points in 2016. Well, I think maybe they got a little bit of help with some uh, Cyrillic uh, printing errors, maybe, huh? And it is, count them, the 43rd seat the Democrats have flipped since Trump took office. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Tony Sneed out of Talking Points Memo penned this last offering here at the Chef's Table of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesday so you don't forget That's right Well, uh... Robert Mueller's team expressed concern yesterday that sensitive information and investigative techniques used in its prosecution of Russian meddling in the 2016 election could wind up in the hands of Russian intelligence. To head off that possibility, Mueller's team has asked the judge in the case against a company uh, accused of funding Russia's social media election meddling to restrict access to discovery turned over to the company's lawyers. Okay, the, you know. Public or unauthorized disclosure of this case's discovery would result in the release of information that would assist foreign intelligence services, particularly those of the Russia Federation and other foreign actors in future operations against the United States, Mueller said. According to the filing, Mueller's team and the lawyers representing Concord Management have had a number of discussions about agreeing to a joint protective order on discovery, but have failed to come together on a few key requests prosecutors are making about who should be authorized to view the materials. Mueller's team is seeking that access to the discovery materials be withheld from the other individuals and entities named as defendants in the Russian troll case who have not yet appeared in court. His proposed order would require that Concord Management get the court's permission before giving those co-defendants access to discovery. The Mueller team also requested that if Concord Management's attorneys want to turn over discovery to any foreign nationals, they identify the foreign nationals for both the court and for a government lawyer separate from Mueller's team called a firewall counsel, and then get the court's approval. If needed, Firewall Counsel would alert the court to any concerns or considerations about such disclosures Mueller's propose, Mueller proposed in the filing. He cited specifically the possibility that certain foreign individuals may try to view discovery materials as a way to obtain sensitive materials as part of an intelligence collection effort. Concord Management has been charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States. The company, according to Mueller, is controlled by Yevgeny Prigozhin, a Kremlin-linked restaurateur nicknamed Putin's chef, who is also an individual defendant in the case, but who has not yet appeared in court. Now, being a chef, I mean, it's really nice if you know the ingredients. If you really trust your palate, though, you can, you know, build those ingredients yourself and then fine tune them until you finally get the taste that, well, you remember. Putin's chef would really like to have the cookbook 
and uh, they know a way of wresting control of it. We'll just use their own rules and laws against them. <laughs> Let's do a Russian dance. Likewise, if Prigazin appears before this court, the protective order would not bar providing discovery to him as an authorized party, Mueller said, referring to a request Mueller says Concord Management's attorneys made that they be permitted to share discovery with a co-defendant if that co-defendant is an officer or employee of Concord Management. To the government's knowledge, the only charged defendant in this category is Prigozhin, who was charged individually for conspiring to defraud the United States. In support of his position, Mueller's team also claimed ominously that discovery in the case could reveal players who were still actively involved in, uh, in, in election interference efforts, but who have not yet been charged. More Russians? Or is it Americans with Russian help? The substance of the government's evidence identifies uncharged individuals and entities that the government believes are continuing to engage in interference operations like those charged in the present indictment. They're going after the 2018 and the 2020 elections. We I told you so. When Mueller first brought charges in February against 13 Russian individuals and three entities accused to facilitating the social media campaign to influence the election, few thought the case could ever make it to a courtroom, given the unlikelihood that Russian President Vladimir Putin would extradite those named in the indictment. In April, two U.S.-based attorneys, Eric A. Dublier and Catherine Sykely, entered an appearance in the case on behalf of Concord Management. They soon after sent prosecutors a sprawling request for discovery before appearing in court to enter Concord Management's plea or even confirming that Concord Management had accepted the summons. Since then, Dublier has been combative, combative with prosecutors in public court proceedings, Prosecutors on Tuesday said that due to its formatting, it would be difficult to redact sensitive information in discovery, which also includes personal details of the Americans whose identities the Russians are accused of stealing. Uh huh. Well, that does bring us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, folks. But uh, Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And let me say one thing about uh, this Russian meddling. I'm a bit concerned about the sharing of discovery or not sharing evidence in discovery. But if foreign actors are involved with a, even a quasi-government intelligence operation, uh, I, th th I mean, I guess what, what Mueller is also saying is that they still got active agents in the field working the case whose lives could conveniently be snuffed out by the convenient heart attack, the convenient mugging, the convenient polonium poisoning, or the convenient fall from a five-story window. Moving a piano, but you don't own a piano, or even own or rent a place five stories up in the air. Indeed. All right, well, we better get out of here. And uh, so stay tuned to Netris Radio for the rest of the day for all the breaking news, because it breaks, even even while it's breaking. And <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, indeed. No Old Bay in that recipe, please. All right, stay tuned to Netroots Radio, and we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon 
jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de te tendre Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 